Second first cut. Golly! Hello, YouTube. Hideki was DQ'd, and there's a million guys tied for first. We're here to break down round one of this week's memorial. Hit the like button. Make sure you're subscribed, and we'll jump into it right now. Welcome to the First Cup Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman. That right there, Kyle Porter. KP, that was one of my best cold opens ever, but only those who watch on YouTube will be able to witness it. It's unfortunate. I wish I wish we could get that to a... Uh... To a larger audience, we got something coming up at the end. It was one of your best, uh, one of your best. This is one of our best closing kicks ever, I think. Ooh, yes, we have after the ad break this evening a very special interview. Aaron Beverly joined us. He wrapped up. How about this? He wrapped up his two under round on PGA Tour Canada, sprinted home to talk to us. That's a nice guy. He is, uh, he's awesome. I mean, I saw him in that, in that tiger press conference at Genesis earlier this year, obviously, I think everybody saw him because everybody was, <laughs> he kind of joked that everybody saw him because they were trying to see tiger. Um, he is, uh, I, God, I mean, I'm, I'm just rooting for him because he was so good. He was so interesting and I don't know. He just, he, he's, he just, he's got a ton of, poise and i don't i don't know i i just i i was i was impressed by him i don't i don't know how you felt but uh he's somebody that i'm definitely rooting for now to make the corn ferry and eventually the pga tour yeah easy to be a fan of uh, i think is the is the best way to put it hideki matsuyama disqualified on a thursday let's just start there there's a couple guys out on the golf course we'll let them wrap up Hideki Matsuyama was disqualified jacob do we have a photo of this anywhere handy maybe if not Pulling that up. Jacob right was the one that Jacob was yep. the one that sent it in. Jacob snitched for sure. Uh, so there was a white substance on Hideki Matsuyama's three wood that to the naked eye appeared to be white out or white paint, something of that consistency that uh apparently Kyle he was using for alignment, but once you start putting stuff on the club face it starts to get to be a hairy situation. It was deemed non-conforming and he was disqualified. Uh, <laughs> this is insane. This, this sport is insane. I've got some quotes. Do you want to, you want the quotes? Of course. So the rules official found out about it on the second hole. Here's the, here's the photo. If you're watching on YouTube, the rules official <laughs> found out about it on the second hole and he went to, or he found out about it on the first hole. He he caught up with the techie on the second hole, and asked him if he had used it because if he hadn't used it yet, uh, he could have just carried it the rest of his round, and it wouldn't have been a, a disqualification, which is kind of hilarious in and of itself, right? And he took some photos of it, and he was asked. Um, because he had been sent his, I guess the rules committee had been sent pictures of this, basically what you see on YouTube right now, which is Hideki's club with white paint on it. And his answer was the pictures were posted on the internet. I'm not 100% sure of the site on the internet. We learned of them literally at one o'clock today as Hideki was playing the first hole. Uh, I was... I looked closer at the picture or at the posting and it said it was taken three days ago. I was hoping it was just on the range or something he was messing around with. Maybe he doesn't have it in his bag, but all the questions that I asked him, he was very honest and forthright about it. And unfortunately it was in his bag and he used it. And so then he was, then the rules official was asked. So somebody called it in. It was not a call in. It was not a call in. Our committee learned of this post. Everyone sees it everywhere, <laughs> which is, I don't know how that works. Uh, how did, how did they learn of it? It was sent to one of our committee members by whom? Another person in the golf world. We don't need to get into that. <laughs> so I don't know how the rules committee obtained this, who sent it, how it was obtained. Uh, but it's it's unfortunate. And uh, there's another quote that I will read you real quick. Uh, the rules official said, I closed my arm and rubbed my fingernail across. One way I could feel it, but the next way I couldn't. Even though it was done with a whiteout-like substance, it was thick enough you could pick up on where it was on the face. Apparently, you can put... I didn't know this. Neither did I. I don't, I don't have all 900 pages of the rule book memorized, but you can put Sharpie dots on your, uh, on your club face for alignment purposes. But as soon as 
the the material that you put on the club face starts interacting with the ball, it becomes illegal. Did you know that? I, no, I'm stunned that you could put anything. I didn't think you could put anything on the club face. You can take a sharpie and you can put alignment things as and it, as long as it doesn't like stick off because that's flat against the club face. But what you can't have, Kyle, are those little tiny little stickers that you use in a simulator on your club face because that's no bueno. Well, that, that's what I was going to say. Didn't Rory Sabatini get disqualified for having those? But 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 were they on the club face or were they on the top? Like, what if you have it on the club head? Club face, but they would not be on like the center of the club face. You put them on the top and you put them on the edges of the club face. So theoretically, if you just like hit one high on the face, it could still be interacting with the ball. I guess in theory, yes. This is the this is the dumbest, greatest sport in the world, and Hideki is no longer playing it at Memorial this weekend. This situation, it's it's the dumbest thing by everybody. Number one, okay, you're using that for alignment, fine, but like you've got to know that that is not allowed. Like the, it, it looks horrible. Number one, and then also it's not a call in, but someone told us about it. Okay, so it's an email in. It's a fat like. Someone obviously brought this to your attention. It goes back to the whole like if this if this was Patrick Rogers, would anyone have noticed? But it's Hideki Matsu. The whole thing is just beyond bizarre, and I cannot believe it actually happened. Well, and and I think I mean I don't think Hideki was like trying to cheat here, but also like I I the. I sort of blame him or, or whoever was messing with his clubs. The, the, the rules official said that somebody works on his clubs. It's happened before. They thought that you just couldn't do it on the driver, but now they found out you can't do it on the three wood also. Like it just, it's not something. So if, if I was to guess, if you just put these, these scenarios in front of me, I would have said, yes, that's illegal. And also it's illegal to have Sharpie marks on, on your club face. Right. Like you err on the conservative side rather than like, I mean, the paint is kind of thick on there. It, it, it doesn't like it, when you look at it, you're like, that doesn't seem right. Right. And, and I just, I don't know. I kind of lay the blame for that on Hideki's team or whoever did it. The, the final thing is this doesn't even like, he's obviously not cheating because this doesn't even give you an advantage. It looks like it'd be a detriment to have that stuff on there. I don't know how that could possibly even help you. Yeah, but you can't, you can't say like, well, I agree, but you can't go out and test like, well, is this substance an advantage or just, you know, like you can't that's test that's all. That's why I thought it was nothing on the club face. What do you mean? Like oh, I yes. put anything right. on the club face. Right. I'm, sh I'm, well, legitimately shocked that you can put Sharpie marks on the club face. Me too. Like at what, because then it becomes, and this is all golf rules. So whatever, but like, then it becomes so subjective to like, well, is this too thick? Is this too thick? Is this too thick? Like at what point is there too much substance on the club face? The, the rules official said, well, it's, it becomes very clear. And you're like, well, w at what point when, like, what if, what if he had the same substance on there, but it was like a tiny, like four dots. I think he could. I think he could play, right? Based on a, a shock to me, but based on the way that it was explained afterwards, which the PGA Tour did a pretty good job of making the officials uh, available for for questioning and and explanation. I, I agree. If it was just like kind of less, like someone had to say, "No, this is too much," or "This is in the wrong spots." But if it was less, I think he could have gotten away with it. He's, the rules official said there was no dots. It wasn't dots. It was actually painted lines. There was no smearing. It's very much set paint. It wasn't smeared at all. How many times has he hit the club this week? I don't know, but it was very fixed, uh, very painted. As I just said on TV, the number one lesson is don't paint the faces of your clubs unless you're using dots, apparently. it's uh, The equipment rules are very specific. It's okay to have very small, discrete markings on your face for alignment purposes, like a Sharpie dot here and there that aren't going to influence the ball. But that much substance is clearly above what the equipment rules allow. Well, it's not clear because there's no like, there's no line of demark like there's no line to cross. I don't know what's clear. I don't know why I'm yelling about this. If the paint had, had been down in the grooves and in the bottom of the grooves where it's not on the face, not making contact with the ball, again, no problem. But it was the face. What a, what a, absolutely insane sport that we cover also i don't know if you noticed this but jacob if you can like you can see on that photo he also painted 
the top portion of the face. So he extended that white part down. Can you see that? Yeah. Where Jacob's at, there was actually also paint there. I wonder if he was just trying to, I don't know what he was trying to accomplish here, but he extended that white top line down a little bit further to almost make the club face appear smaller. It makes it, it almost makes it look like maybe more symmetrical where the, uh, I don't know. Actually, it makes it look less symmetrical. I can't believe we're breaking down an Instagram photo, a club face with paint on it. Yeah. Well, Hideki's gone. He's been disqualified. So did anybody in our, uh, want to done pick him? Oh God. I don't know. We'll have to find out. Jacob, let us, let us know what the case is on that. Uh, leaderboard. One, two, three, four, five, six tied at the top. 67, five under par. Cam Young, Luke List, Cam Smith, KH Lee, Mackenzie Hughes, Davis Riley. I'm starting to think, Kyle, this Davis Riley kid, this Cam Young kid, I think they're pretty decent at golf. Yeah, I was going to say, there's, there's definitely, can you pull the, um, can you pull the leaderboard up, producer Jacob? Cause I'd like to just kind of talk through these top seven. I uh, think that there's, do what? I was going to say, while while he does that, nobody had Hideki in the one and done. I wish Mark would have had him. Uh, okay, Cam Young, Luke List, Cam Smith. Uh, there's definitely a... Uh, I don't know who the favorite is. I presume it's Cam Smith or maybe uh, Will Zalatoris. But when I look at Davis Riley and Cam Young, there's definitely a difference to me between them and then Luke List, Mackenzie Hughes, and KH Lee. Those guys are obviously playing good golf, but Riley is out of his mind right now. And Cam Young is, is I'm probably forgetting somebody, but the, he's probably the rookie of the year, right? As of right no, he, now? Yeah, Mito, Mito could have taken it from him if he won the PGA. But uh, I mean, honestly, Riley and Cam Young have to be the front, runner, r- front runners for it. And Cam and, Young. And, yes, and Mito. Uh, but yeah, Davis Riley's been awesome basically since Valspar when he finished second. I think he missed like one or two cuts in there, but he's been yeah. like low key solid. And Cam Young, Cam Young might be on the President's Cup team. I and I feel like nobody even knows who he is. Yeah, because he's piling up top three finishes, earning a lot of points to, to that'll go a long way for that. Yeah, and then you get like a lot of those guys in there: KH Lee, Luke List. Mackenzie Hughes, they kind of just putted out of their mind. They didn't have as good of um, like Davis Riley was awesome from T to green. Uh, Cam Young led the field from T to green. So those are the guys that I'm kind of just excited. I mean, uh, getting your first win at Memorial for either of those guys would be pretty awesome. They they are clearly separating themselves uh, from the rest of this uh, this rookie class, along with with Mito as well. I have some bad news for you. Uh, Mark's selection for this week is Cam Young. Of course. Jeez, no guy. doubt. This guy can't miss. Uh, I, don't even Cam- who, I don't even remember who I picked. I don't even want to know. <laughs> Cam Smith is indeed the favorite seven to one. According to our friends over at Caesar Sportsbook, Rory McElroy, number two. He is 11 to one. He just wrapped up his rounds two under 70. So he is three shots back. Cam Young, Davis Riley sharing. 12 to 1, and then Will Zalatoris, just one shot back, lurking KP, 14 to 1, uh, obviously shook off that miscut quite quickly from last week. Yeah, I think I, I was, uh, we talked on, well, I, we've talked a lot of places, but I think it was on HQ, and I talked about how I was, I took Homa, Max Homa in a, in a matchup over, um, uh, Will Zalatoris and my reasoning was not good. It was because Zalatoris had missed the cut at his last two tour events, uh, even though he almost won the PGA Championship. So he missed the cut at Byron Nelson. He missed the cut at uh, at Colonial, and I think it's just I don't know. Like, do we think he just plays good on hard courses? I don't know that it necessarily has to be a major championship setup. I think it's just hard courses. Is that a is that a better way to say like kind of where uh, Will Zalatoris is at right now? Yes, I think his game is better for harder courses. He, the the things that he does well, uh, they get kind of magnified on some of these tougher 
tougher golf courses. So yes, it, I think that's just, it ends up aligning with a lot of his great results being on these. I don't, I don't think he just magically plays better or convinces himself of that. I think his game is just tr travels to those places better. And I think I, I looked at colonial as kind of one of those, like a harder, like a more difficult golf course and he missed the cut there. So I was a little leery of him coming into the week, but obviously, I mean, he played great on Thursday. So this, this, uh, favorites list, this, this, uh, this odds board right now is, loaded i mean this is great uh it's awesome jordan speeds 22 to 1 did you watch his round this morning i did not i did okay. see he was leading the field in putting yes and he bogeyed both par fives no sorry of course he bogeyed 11 and he parred five and he parred 15 so he played them at uh why can't i not do math? oh no he's there's four par fives God, uh, he played them at two over Kyle. My whole point being that he has more juice to squeeze out of this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if he's going to gain, I, I think at last I saw he was at three or three and a half strokes, uh, putting he's going to, he's going to win. I think, I mean, he's hitting it. He's hitting it that good right now. I didn't hit it great today, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pumped. I mean, Memorial is a big deal. We talked with, uh, Aaron Beverly about, Genesis being a big deal, Riviera. This is, I think, sixth, the sixth uh, best strength of field tournament of the year, right behind Genesis. And um, it's a great, it's a great round one leaderboard. Ingrid Lindblad is leading the U.S. Women's Open. Caveat there, she is an amateur. Kyle, do you like amateur or amateur? Uh, amateur. Amateur. Do you think do you think it's because that's correct or you just think it makes you sound smarter when you say it? I think it, I think it makes you sound like you're like more sophisticated, like you're, you're, a, like you're worldly. Like if you say amateur, amateur sounds like I'm from Oklahoma, which I am. <laughs> <laughs> that's self-aware. That's self-awareness that you get on this yeah, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the last time an amateur Led outright after any U.S. Women's Open round was the final round in 1967. Catherine Lacoste won it. She's the only amateur to ever win the U.S. Women's Open. Uh, whew, good luck. Good luck sleeping on that. I would. I would not be able to walk straight if I was leading the U.S. Women's Open. No, no, not at all. I, I will say, like, she is a very experienced amateur. Am amateur. Uh, in that, I mean, she, she's one of the people that I always follow at the, at the, uh, at the annual at the Augusta national women's amateur. She's played in it. Uh, well, they've only had what, uh, two, two, I think three, she's played in all of them. And, uh, she nearly won this year. She's, she's a really good player. So is it going to last? Probably not. It would be amazing if it did to have an amateur win a, a major championship, either on the, the men's or women's side would be, uh, would be incredible, but it's a great board. Lexi Thompson's up there. Uh, Minji Lee is up there. This is, uh, yeah, this is, this is fun. And it's, and it's a cool kind of subplot storyline to have an amateur at the, uh, at the very, I mean, we had, uh, what was the girl's name last year? That was that, uh, nearly, she didn't almost win it, but she was in like the final pairing on Sunday. Yes. Um, she went she to from, Stanford, right? She up she to Stanford? Was, well, she, I don't think she's in college yet. She was from New Jersey. Help us out, producer Jacob. Uh, she was at the ANWA this year. She played the ANWA this year. Well, Send help. I've got a, we can't, we can't there we go. Say it again. Mega Gagne. There you go. So she was in it until the until the very end on on Sunday last year. So it's not it's yeah. not uh, without precedent, uh, we, even in like the the kind of modern uh, U.S. Women's Open. So should be fun. Pine Noodles looks great. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Lots of great golf for the rest of the week. We'll be back to cover it after each and every round. Kyle, any final thoughts before? Don't leave, people. Don't leave. There's more coming. We're going to go to a break. We're going to run the Aaron Beverly interview, but any final thoughts uh, on this side of it, KP? No, I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited for some good golf this weekend between Memorial, the U S women's open. Uh, I'm going to be following Beverly at the Canadian event. Should be, uh, should be a ton of fun to, uh, to catch some golf as we head in, head into summer this week. All right.
Aaron Beverly interview coming on the other side. Jacob, run it. I'm not comfortable living in a hot dog. It's still way better than your house, kitty. I can't do this anymore, ma'am. If you won't listen to me, then I really don't have a choice. So you're running away? South Park, the streaming wars. Now streaming. Okay, well, I'll see ya. Bye, honey. Okay. Exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. And we're back. Happy to welcome in Aaron Beverly, who's been playing and playing well on the APGA. Aaron, thank you very much for joining us. Much appreciated for the time. Oh, thank you for having me. Appreciate being on here. Uh, game seems pretty sharp, right? I'm, I'm, I'm looking through the leaderboards. I'm checking out the finishes. You got to feel pretty stout about your game right now. Yeah, the game's feeling pretty solid. It's been like a work in progress kind of since I won back in Wilshire in November. Just kind of a lot of stuff has happened since then. But yeah, so it's definitely trending in the right direction. And you're currently in Canada. Right. So this is you're you're kicking off the, the Canadian swing here. Describe to us what the next handful of weeks looks like for you from a kind of a competitive as aspect. Yeah. In Canada, currently, uh, our season is 11 tournaments through 15 weeks. So it kind of spans the whole country. Right now we're in Victoria. Next stop is in Edmonton and then uh, I think Saskatchewan and then Prince Edward Island. So kind of work our way all the way east and then kind of come back towards the west so putting in a lot of frequent flyer miles and and basically seeing a country that i've only ever seen one of the time so it's nice to kind of be back up here and, and playing again take take us back through i'm curious i was reading through everything and and obviously had had known about you from uh from riviera this year from the genesis invitational but take us back through like what post-college looked like for you as you kind of entered into playing golf professionally and just what that like just even like a timeline of, of what that what, what that was like for you yeah so I graduated college in 2017 and immediately kind of like most kids these days moved back home with my parents and as soon as I got back home my dad was like all right now you need to get a job <laughs> and I was like okay well I thought playing professional golf was going to be my main focus <laughs> but I needed needed a way or like a place to play and practice at. So I went and worked at Silverado Country Club in Napa where they have the safe, well, it used to be the Safeway Open. Now it's the Fortinet uh, Open. So worked there, uh, did every job possible there, was in the pro shop, was on the driving range, was cart kid, caddy, uh, all basically to fund my professional playing career. So turned professional in 2018, uh, got status on the Latin America tour in Canada that year. Um, did a bunch of Monday qualifiers and then 2019 had a little bit more success and then got a full season up in Canada. Uh, so I came up here and played and then went back home, played some mini tour stuff and then kind of, you know, the world shut down in 2020. So didn't really do much there other than some mini tour stuff in California. And then 2021 kind of the same path and then, you know, APGA towards the end of the year and then back. 2022 now i'm back up in canada yeah it's it's so um i don't know what the right word is i was gonna say it's so funny to hear the, the grind described right i don't think people realize uh like it's it's not it's not rory mcelroy for everybody and everybody's yeah. very good there's only so many spots and finding a way to advance the game finding a place to compete aaron can be mm -hmm. difficult at times yeah, no doubt. Uh, and somebody told me the other day, because I was working actually at another country club, same reason to you know fund my playing career. And I put my two weeks in and they asked me what I was planning on doing. I said, oh, I'm just going to focus on playing professionally. And the guy told me, he's like, oh, it's really difficult, you know, path you're choosing. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, any path you choose, if you want to be top 150 in the world at anything is going to be really difficult. So I'm, you know, I believe in myself and believe in the work that I put in my whole entire life. And this is what I love to do. So I'm just along for the ride and enjoying myself every step of the way. That's, that's a really good point. I, I, it's, I think it's, yeah, we don't often think about like the PGA Tour being only the top 125, 160, what, you know, whatever the number is guys. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious for you, like, what is the, what is the best path forward into 
into the PGA tour or is that, is that like, obviously that's like the destination that everybody wants, but what is, what is the best path forward for you? Is it qualifying through a different tour? Is it like, like, is it winning to like, like what for you is like, okay, I think, I think this is the path, I'm not positive. I can do it, but I believe in myself. That's what I'm going to attempt to do over the next however many years. Yeah, I think it starts with uh, PJ Tour Canada uh, for me, and then having success on this tour would lead directly into the Corn Ferry Tour, and then have a you know success on that tour would lead right into the PGA Tour. So that is kind of the path I see for myself. Um, there's also you know other ways to do it. You can Monday qualify into a PGA Tour event, or you can get you know a sponsors exemption into a couple events and play well, and then just immediately get jumped into it. So. There's different ways to do it. I think my timeline for myself is definitely Canada to Corn Ferry to PGA Tour. Real quick, Rick, let me follow up on that. I know that for uh, Corn Ferry to PGA, it's top 25 regular season, top 25 playoffs. What is the, like, how does that work for Canada into Corn Ferry? Top 10. So top 10 at the end of the year, <laughs> go Corn Ferry. That's, that's nasty. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's tough. That, that's, yeah. I, but so the way I look at it is at the end of the day, it's still just golf, right? And everyone's got to hit the same shots. Everyone's got to play the same courses. Um, so I don't look at, you know, I don't judge myself off other people. I just try to make sure I focus on what I'm doing. And as I do it to the best of my abilities, then everything will take care of itself. Yeah. I, I want to um, do look back for just one second because uh kyle mentioned this mentioned this earlier we saw yet we saw yet rib we saw yet the genesis invitational and i'd be remiss because uh today as we talk this would have been charlie sifford's 100th birthday you earned the charlie sifford exemption into the genesis invitational i can imagine this is a great day of reflection for his for all of us for his contributions to the game yeah, definitely. I mean, it's I'm able to compete on this tour because of Charlie um, and everything that he's done to advance the game of golf. You know, because before him, it was a wide only clause to be on the PJ Tour. So without me or without him, there's not Hideki, you know, as we were just talking about this and a handful of other guys, not just African-American golfers. So his impact on the game of golf is, is exponential and, you know, worldwide, not just, you know, something that should be celebrated in America. For sure. What was, what was that like? And you probably get asked about this all the time, but the, the press conference with tiger, uh, it's gotta be, well, I, I'd love for you to describe it, but it's gotta be surreal to just be sitting there and looking, you know, next to you and you're like, that's freaking tiger standard. I mean, I, you know, like, it's just, it's such a, I still do that. And I've been covering this for like 10 years now. And like, what, what was that like for you? Did you like, did you enjoy it? Were you <laughs> nervous? What, what were the emotions going through? You? Yeah. So naturally I'm not a nervous person uh, for the most part, kind of any situation, but when I met him earlier and we had a conversation and we were walking to the press conference, he goes, Hey, you're going to answer every question. I'm like, they're not going to ask me anything. The world <laughs> wants, the world wants to hear from you. They don't want to hear from me. And so we were laughing and then they opened the door to the media center. And as soon as they opened the door and I looked, that's when I got nervous. Cause yeah. there's a bunch of people and a bunch of cameras. And I'm like, Oh, you know, my college comms class freshman year didn't prepare me for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we walked down and we sat down and as we sat down, I'm so thankful that they had water on the table because my mouth went dry instantly. And I just remember sitting there and I stared at one of the cameras and I'm like, this is being broadcast around the world. And I'm like, all right, just don't say anything stupid. And he was sitting there. I remember one time like, I got stuck looking at his arm for some reason because I'm like, that's really Tiger's arm. Uh, but it was it was awesome. I mean, it was just a, one of those moments in life that I'll never forget. And I'm sure I'll tell my kids and grandkids about it. It's great that it's on YouTube because I can show them so they know I'm not lying. Um, but yeah, it was it was pretty special. Yeah, that's that's so sick. And then to be out there with your peers at Riv, I mean, Riviera is just like just walking on the ground at Riviera is like almost a religious experience for me. I mean, it's just yeah. absolutely perfect. And you being out there competing, I mean, I imagine something like that just fuels the fire, right? Like I, I belong here. I want to be back here. I, I want to be doing this week in and week out. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, even the Tuesday when I played the practice round, I played nine holes with Max Homa, Ches Reevy, and Matt Wallace. And Homa and I played a game, like just a little money game against those two. And like Homa and I won and I contributed, which was great. So it was just one of those things like when you see yourself competing against those guys that you see on TV all the time or, you know, you hear stories about, it's awesome to just be there and really feel like you fit in and that you belong and that you can compete on that level. So definitely added fuel to the fire, as you said, and, and just more motivation to go out there, keep practicing and, and get back to that stage. I'd love to take it back a little bit further to just when you were growing up and um, I kind of read some about that. And I, I was fascinated by a couple of different things, uh, but maybe most of all by uh, you, you were really involved in ballet. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Until you're like 17 years old. And I'm curious about how that translated to golf like what what there helped you the most whether it was physical or mental as it related to golf yeah i think the easiest answer is flexibility and uh just balance that's kind of the first two things that you take away from dance but honestly for me like dancing and preparing for shows and like the summer intensives that we did is so much harder than anything golf related I mean, because not only like do you, your moves have to be perfect, you have to be matched up with everybody else who's dancing. Then you're on stage and it's with music. So everything's got to be, you know, on cue and on point. So, I mean, it's it's great. I'm so thankful to have that as, as my background and that I did it. Um, I think the transition from dance to golf was seamless just because the discipline you have that you take from ballet works right in, you know, when you practice in golf. So they're both kind of slower paced um, sports, if you want to call it ballet sport, it's art form, but it just, it was really helpful for me, you know, to kind of transition through and, and take it into golf. Yeah. I think we have a, do we have a photo here, Rick? Here we go. Wow. How yeah. about that? Mr. Jacob, yeah. if you're watching YouTube, that would... is, what are we looking at here, Aaron? Okay. Well, so look, he, what's, looking what's, at it's corn ACL, if that's me. So what's, What's great about this is this was dress rehearsal and they didn't put the makeup on me yet. So the makeup for the show was this like really extravagant face makeup because I was the Chinese man. So it was it was the nutcracker and I yeah, the face like itself was it a lot to handle. But yeah, <laughs> that's uh that's me, young me. I man, I could jump really high back when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it was that was a good time. That's you mentioned awesome. kind of the 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 synchronization and and working as a unit in dance, but golf is golf is not that. Golf is golf is you. Um, how you know contrasting those two things is there one you prefer over another? Uh, well, dance is definitely easier on you mentally. That's for sure. Golf can be stressful uh, if you let it, but I just love golf. Just like. I loved practicing golf more than I loved practicing ballet. I loved performing when I was dancing. Uh, but for me, golf is just every day is something different. And you never really know what to expect, no matter how much you practice and you play. Each course is different. Weather is different. So for me, golf, you know, wins. Obviously, that's the one I'm still doing. But ballet will always have a place in my heart. And whether I have a girl or a boy one day, they're going to dance. And I'll be sure that, you know, I take a couple classes with them, too. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I'm curious about one thing Rick and I talk a lot about is just like this almost comical level of self-belief that you have to have to be one of the best players in the world. And I'm curious for you, what most affects your own self-belief, whether good or bad. So like what it, what improves it the most and what uh, decreases it the most just in, in kind of your day-to-day -day, uh, routine. I would say what always gave me confidence was always my dad. He believed in me more than I believed in myself, which is, I'd like to think I believe in myself a lot. So for him to be, you know, one of me meant a lot. Um, but yeah, you're right. You kind of do just have to have this almost false sense of confidence all the time. Golf, especially if you had a bad shot, you got to move on to the next one because the next one's the most important shot. So what affects me negatively honestly nothing too much anymore i've kind of just separated myself from kind of bad energy on the golf course just because 
it doesn't help. Like if I get yeah. angry or if I slam a club, it, it doesn't help me at all. So I just try to stay on this level line with my confidence as much as possible. And then I, I know your, your father sadly passed away, I believe end of 2019. It, it, and, yeah. and I know you've talked about how like, that's been a, that's been hard to just, um, obviously as a dad, but also as like your swing coach and just somebody to, to be there to encourage you. How have you, like, where have you turned for that encouragement or that um, help as it relates to kind of the mental side of your game? I mean, honestly, it's just been kind of all to myself. Um, and it was hard at first, I would say the first like six to eight months after he passed, just because after every round I could call him, every day I could call him or we practice together. So I could always, you know, fall back on whatever, you know, he had to say. And just uh, now it's all internal. So I, I have tried to handle everything myself um, and just rely on what he used to tell me as much as I can. But at the same time, like I have one of my best friends here, Aaron, he's caddying for me this week. So he gets to deal with me and kind of go through the conversations day in and day out on the golf course and kind of what may come up. But yeah, there's no replacing somebody like my dad. I mean, he's my best yeah. friend, like you said, my swing coach, my mentor, everything. So it would be a disservice to him if I tried to find a replacement. So I just rely on everything we talked about. You, you, Aaron, are going to be one of the subjects of uh, a CBS Sports uh, a docu series. So there's there's two episodes that are going to air essentially uh, in regards to life on the APGA, which is the Advocates Pro Golf Association. Their their stated mission, Aaron, is to prepare African Americans and other minorities to compete and win at the highest level of professional golf. How important is an organization like this in our game right now? It's huge. I mean, to have the support um, from, you know, different companies that support the ABJ, whether it's Cisco or Farmers Insurance uh, and all the guys that work for the APGA, um, Ken Bentley and everybody, you know, kind of behind the scenes, it's great just to have that support of everyone to kind of see this game of golf grow. And it's honestly, like Aaron and I were talking about it the other day, the first day we came out here to Canada. Uh, like normally when you go to a golf tournament, especially up here, there's nobody that looks like us. I mean, there's one other kid that has full status, Danny List. He's from Australia, lives in San Diego now, but he's, you know, of African American descent. So, when we go to these ABJ tour events and there's 50, 60, you know, of us out there, it's, it's great. And it's like a brotherhood. So, you know, you never feel like you're alone, which is huge. And I said this before, but you're comfortable in your own skin, which is something that should never be taken for granted. Cause when you go elsewhere and you're the only one that looks like you, you know, it, it can be kind of daunting at times. So to have the APGA, and have tournaments to play on there and, you know, have a chance for the support when we move on is, is exponentially great for the game of golf. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm curious about just as, you know, obviously I haven't walked in those shoes and I'm, and I'm curious about what maybe like your experience of the world has been different than mine. Right. And mm -hmm. like what as, you know, somebody who's white and a journalist and like not playing and not, you know, not a person of color, like what would you like for somebody like me to understand about being in your shoes and um, about like maybe some of the difficulties that I don't understand in trying to uh, make it in, 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 in kind of the world that you're in, in professional golf? Yeah, my junior year of college, I took a psychology class and the teacher asked us this great question that I ended up asking my teammates and I can ask you the same one right now. She started the class, she goes, for everyone in the class, how often do you wake up and do you think about the color of your skin and your ethnicity? And at the time I was the only African-American in the class. So I raised my hand first, I said, every day. I said, because mm -hmm. I can sit in this classroom right now and there's nobody else that looks like me. And so I went to practice that day with my college team and I asked them the same question. And of course, all of them said, you know, we don't ever think about it. And I said, for me, this is a daily, you know, just, it's not something that I really want to think about, but it's just 
in the world that I live in and especially, you know, playing golf, it's just, that's how it is. I'm usually one of one. And so there's pressure that comes with that because you have to, you know, you want to set a good precedent for everybody that looks like you or may come after you uh, so that people don't have a bad impression of, you know, not just you, but everyone else. So that is kind of the one question I would pose for most people to think about. Um, and if it's not something that you think about every day, kind of, you know, imagine what it would be like to go into a country club or go into a different space and just have to know that you are a little bit different and that people may look at you a little bit different or people may treat you, you know, somewhat different. How, how often you think about your races is one of the things that, that really stuck with me, my wife of Iranian descent. I, I, I told her the same. I never think about my race. She, yeah. people ask her, where are you from? She says, Virginia. And they say, no, but where are you from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I've never been asked, no, but where are you from? Meaning, why does your skin look the way that it looks? Mm -hmm. uh, which is something I've never, ever encountered in my entire life. And it's my, it, it, and, and there are plenty of people who are encountering that literally every single day. Um, I, I noticed that you do, Aaron, give back your time. You know, you, you volunteer as uh, assistant men's uh, golf coach at, at your alma mater, right? Cal State University, Sacramento. Do you yep. feel it? important to continue to give back and do your part as a, as a great representative of this sport. Yeah. I always just try to be the exact same person my dad was to me, uh, for other people. And I went to practice a couple of times, uh, with the Sac state team before I was a coach and they, I loved all the guys. I loved the practice habits. And then I looked at the tournament scores and they weren't, you know, kind of in line with how I thought they should be playing. So, I just asked the coach if I could, you know, help out. And he said, sure. And sure enough, I went to a couple of tournaments and saw some things that the guys could do a little bit better and helped them out. And it was, that was my way of giving back, but that's always how my dad was to me. And I think it's important that everybody has someone that can, you know, if you have the ability to give back, I feel like you, it's a responsibility you should. So that's just how I was raised. And that's how I'm always going to be moving forward. Do you think that I'm reading the uh, <clears throat> there's a hundred Tiger Woods books, but I'm reading the Tiger Woods book from uh, like four or five years ago by Armin Katayan and Jeff Benedict. And it's really interesting. And most of it is is good. Uh, but I, I, I'm always shocked when I read about, you know, just sort of like golf's culture even as recently as like the early 90s mid 90s late 90s like stuff that we were all alive for uh, which is it's just it's it's not good and i'm curious about whether you feel like it's getting worse it, 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 in terms of like the way people of color are, are treated or, or or um uh in, invited in or you, you know whatever uh do you feel like it's getting worse do you feel like it's neutral or do you feel like it's getting better and how does the apga kind of kind of play into all that yeah I, I want to say it's getting better it might be slowly but it is getting better i mean i think COVID honestly helped out a lot because it introduced a whole new generation to golf i mean i had buddies of mine that played baseball in high school or didn't, you know, had never touched a golf club. And they were calling me, Hey, can we get some golf lessons? You know, <laughs> we're trying to get into it. And it was just one of those things. Cause there wasn't much to do. Like you couldn't travel, you couldn't really do anything, but the golf courses were always open. So that definitely helped uh, in terms of tournaments and kind of the way golf looks. It's so tough because it's so expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. if you want to be really good at golf, I, the amount of money you have to put into it is most people don't have it. And especially most people of color don't have it. And it's, you know, from a large bucket of balls being $12 to a full set of like good clubs being probably close to 3000 to $5,000 having a pay, place to play, you know, three to five times a week. Now traveling for tournaments, paying for tournaments, paying for food, paying for rental cars, flights. I mean, it all adds up. And, Whereas if you want to play basketball, you need a ball, you need some shoes or soccer. And so that's where like the APGA comes in and it's huge because 
they support us, you know, and the tournaments are on great golf courses. You know, the entry fees aren't as expensive as some other mini tours. The purses are getting a lot better than they've used to be. So it's great to have an organization like that. Now you need 20 organizations like that. So you can, you know, not just touch 50 people or you can hit, you know, a thousand. And so until that part of it kind of changes and there's, you know, like some substantial financial backing behind it, it's hard to see it really progress rapidly. I mean, it's great. Like Steph Curry now has a tournament yeah. for, you know, minorities that's free for them. And, you know, he takes care of the cost, which is great. So you just need that initiative moving forward a lot more of it. Yeah. Yeah. Steph, Steph Curry. Also Billy Horschel, um, put on like a, a an APGA event, right? He was a, a host of one. Yep. Yep. This this uh this docuseries from CBS Sports. So I want to make sure I get this in here. So two it's gonna air uh two different days. Tuesday, June seventh, CBS Sports Network, seven thirty PM Eastern time. That's called The Founder Life on the APGA Tour. And then June eleventh at one PM Eastern cbs television network that is up and down life on the apga tour was this like a netflix style doc were they following you around with cameras in your face at all times how intrusive was this process yeah no it was it was pretty interesting i mean it was one of those things like you see it for other people but when it's happening to you and there's cameras in the car and there's cameras when you're cooking and there's cameras everywhere uh, it's it took a little bit to get used to uh but i'm so good now at like putting the tape under the shirt and having the mic, you know, ready to go. But, but it, it was a uh, pretty neat, uh, to kind of be a part of it. And I'm excited to see, you know, how it turns out and, and kind of the response. Yeah. I, I, every time I see like just out on tour guys being followed around with cameras, I, I can't, I don't understand how they act normal. I would be just like either not say anything or be like an idiot trying to make jokes and like they wouldn't be funny and it, it just it's got it's got to be hard to get used to um guy i got a i got a bunch of things i could ask you i'll, I'll go with this because i know we're running out of time here but um who have you been around whether it was playing with tour guys or on many tours or in college who have you been around that you you see them hit the ball and you're like wow that's that's different. Like that, that impresses me. Cause I mean, Rick and I talk about this, everybody hits it pretty good, but there's some guys that you're like, that's a little bit different. Who, who was that guy for you? The first one that comes to mind was Cameron champ. When we grew up as kids, we played in a tournament in Georgia. And I remember I hit a driver. I'd hit it decent, nothing great, but he had his two iron past my driver. And I looked at my dad and I was like, I look back at this club. I'm like, he really just hit that past my driver. So that one was the first one. Um, since then, gosh, I played my final round of high school golf with Bryson, but that was before Bryson was Bryson. Yeah. Uh, so Bryson. that wasn't too different. <laughs> I played my final round of college with Colin Morikawa. He hit his irons really good. So yeah. I always, always remember that. Um, and then Matt played with Max Homa a couple months ago and he had his driver really straight. And that was like my one takeaway. So just bits and pieces kind of from everybody. Yeah. I love that. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time here. We could do this for a couple more, a couple more hours, I'm sure. But, but Aaron, two under 68 in uh, the opening rounds of the Royal Beach Victoria, uh, Victoria Open. I can say that we're going to run that tonight. So I'm not, I'm not dating this podcast or anything. So um, you, you know, Looking, looking towards Friday's second round, what did you do well today? Uh, what are you excited for? How do you size up your chances? Yeah, today we just kept everything in front of us. My dad always used to tell me you can't win the tournament on the first day, but you sure can take yourself out of it. So that's kind of been my mentality on first rounds. Um, yeah, hit it decent, putted pretty solid, got up and down when I was out of position. So that was all good. Tomorrow is just it's supposed to rain here overnight and in the morning. So the course will be a little bit softer. Uh, so it can be a little bit more aggressive in flags because right now the greens were really firm. So you couldn't just fire at every pin. So try to, you know, put it close to the hole and make putts is kind of the job description for tomorrow. I love it. KP, any final thoughts before we let him get back to uh, dinner or whatever else he's got planned for tonight? No, I did. I did. Basketball I did. Game. 
<laughs> watching did, the finals, baby. Let's go. I know. That's what I want to do, too. I did read that you were tight with uh, Greg Vaughn, which Rick and I both grew up playing baseball. So that was a uh, that was a blast from the past. That was awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, GV's my guy. I, I met him when I was in college. Uh, we played one of our college AMs at his home course where he's a member, and we hit it off right away and ended up playing a couple of his charity events and still see him pretty much every week when I'm back home. So, yeah, that's, GV's, that's, GV's awesome. That's very cool, man. I it, This was uh, this was great. I appreciate your um, – yeah, t- I appreciate your time, but also just like – uh, being honest about uh, answering some of these these questions and and uh, yeah, we wish you the best. We're rooting for you and uh, uh, yeah, hope things go well for you and 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 we're uh, we're covering you out on the PGA tour soon. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And anytime you guys need somebody to talk to, I'm always around. <laughs> Awesome stuff. Aaron Beverly there. You can find him on Twitter. Do you tweet a lot, Aaron? Should they follow you on Twitter or would you prefer Instagram? Nah, else? Instagram Instagram is fine. My Twitter, I just go just to read stuff. I don't tweet hey. at all. All right. I'll leave tweet that to Homa. <laughs> <laughs> Tough act to follow there. Aaron Beverly, that's Kyle Porter. I'm Rick Gaiman. This has been the first cut. We'll catch you next time.